let's move on to the next topic, termination of employment. What are the modes of terminating employer-employee relationship? We have here number one, voluntary resignation. Number two, involuntary resignation or constructive dismissal. Number three, abandonment of employment or constructive resignation. Number four, dismissal for cause. Number five, expiration of employment contract for fixed-term employees. Number six, completion of project for project employees. Number seven, layoff for a period exceeding six months. And number eight, retirement. Note the coverage of the law on termination of employment under Article 293 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. The provisions of the Labor Code on termination of employment are extended to employees of non-profit entities such as educational, medical, religious, or charitable institutions and organizations. Employees of such entities are therefore entitled to the same rights and benefits granted to workers of industrial and commercial enterprises such as the right to security of tenure. Dismissal of employees. It should be recalled that all employees are guaranteed the right to security of tenure in the sense that they cannot be dismissed without just cause or authorized cause. Remember Article 297 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. An employer may terminate an employment for any of the following causes. A. Serious misconduct or willful disobedience by the employee of the lawful orders of his employer or representative in connection with his work. B. Gross and habitual neglect by the employee of his duties. C. Fraud and willful breach by the employee of the trust reposed in him by his employer or duly authorized representative. D. Commission of a crime or offense by the employee against the person of his employer or any immediate member of his family or his duly authorized representative. And E. Other causes analogous to the foregoing. Misconduct. What is the meaning of misconduct? It is improper or wrong conduct. It is the transgression of some established and definite rule of action, a forbidden act, a dereliction of duty, willful in character, and implies a wrongful intent and not a mere error of judgment. Misconduct will constitute a just cause for dismissal if it is serious and work-connected. What are examples in jurisprudence of misconduct that is both serious and work-connected? Number one, fighting inside company premises. This is because it adversely affects the employer's interests considering that it distracts employees, disrupts operations, and creates a hostile work atmosphere. When the dismissed employee did not instigate the fight and was in fact the victim who was constrained to defend himself, his dismissal is not warranted. When the fighting was prearranged by the employer to give semblance of lawful cause for dismissal, then the victims do not deserve to be dismissed. Number two, engaging in sexual intercourse inside company premises. Number three, making false accusations against the employer. Number four, series of irregularities when taken in their totality may constitute serious misconduct. Misconduct that is serious but not work-connected will not warrant the penalty of dismissal. Misconduct that is work-connected but not serious will merely warrant a penalty lesser than dismissal. Disobedience to orders or instructions Disobedience to orders will constitute a just cause for dismissal if it is number 1. Willful or intentional and number 2. The order is reasonable and lawful, known to the employee, and in connection with the duties which the employee had been engaged to discharge. Disobedience is willful if it is done intentionally, knowingly, and purposely, without justifiable excuse, as distinguished from an act done carelessly, thoughtlessly, heedlessly, or inadvertently. What are examples in jurisprudence of willful disobedience? Number one. Refusal to obey a transfer order. Number two, refusal to obey instruction to buy food supplies from a new supplier. Number three, refusal to obey a directive to render overtime work to meet a job order deadline. Remember that the order must be reasonable. The reasonableness of an order or instruction depends upon the circumstances availing in each case. What is an example of a reasonable order? A directive prohibiting employees from using company vehicles for private purposes without authority from management. What are examples of unreasonable orders? 
Number one, a directive transferring an employee to a non-existent position. Number two, a directive ordering employees assigned in Basilan to report to the Manila office without giving them money for their transportation and living expenses. Number three, a directive discouraging its employees from going to the comfort room during working hours. Remember also that the order must be lawful. An order is lawful if it is not contrary to law, morals, good customs, public policy, or public order. What is an example of a lawful order? A directive ordering a manager to dismiss strikers who committed illegal acts during the strike. What are examples of an unlawful order? A directive ordering a supervisor to dismiss employees who organized a union. A directive obliging employees to purchase goods from the store owned by the employer is an unlawful order because it is contrary to Article 112 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. A directive requiring an employee to organize a company union is an unlawful order because it is an unfair labor practice. A directive requiring employees to sign an antedated employment contract. Also, remember that the order must be known to the employee. This is self-explanatory because an employee cannot be expected to comply with an unknown order. The order must be in connection with the duties of the employee. If the order is not connected with the nature of the employee's engagement, refusal to obey will not constitute willful disobedience. Neglect of duty. What is the meaning of neglect of duty? It is the failure to give proper attention to a task expected of an employee because of carelessness or indifference. Neglect of duty will constitute a valid cause for dismissal if it is both 1. Gross, that is, glaringly noticeable, and 2. Habitual, that is, more than a single or isolated act. Neglect is not the same as negligence. Neglect indicates, as a purely objective fact, that a person has not done that which it was his duty to do. It does not indicate the reason for this failure. Example, a bank teller forgetting to lock the vault. Negligence, on the other hand, is a subjective state of mind. It indicates a particular reason why the man has failed to do his duty, namely because he has not kept the performance of the duty in his mind as he ought to have done. Example, the bank teller failing to lock the vault as she was in a hurry to leave the bank because she had a date. A man can neglect his duty either intentionally or negligently. Damage is not an essential element. An employee can be dismissed for gross and habitual neglect of duty even if the employer did not sustain any damage. It is enough that the neglect tends to damage or prejudice the employer. The employer should not be expected to wait until he suffers damage or injury before taking action against the employee. What are examples of gross and habitual neglect of duty? Number one, habitual tardiness. And number two, habitual absenteeism. Fraud. Fraud is the knowing misrepresentation of the truth or concealment of a material fact to induce another to act to his or her detriment. Fraud will constitute a just cause for dismissal if it is 1. Work connected and 2. Committed against the employer, that is, not against third persons. What are examples and jurisprudence of work connected fraud? Number 1. Illegal pooling of baggage by an airline employee. Number 2. Underweighing of cargo by an airline employee. Remember that the fraud must be committed against the employer. Fraud committed against third persons may still be a valid cause for dismissal if it will put the employer under the risk of being embroiled in unnecessary lawsuits from such third persons. Breach of trust. Breach of trust will constitute a valid cause for dismissal if number 1. The employee holds a position of trust and number 2. The breach of trust is willful and work-connected. Note those employees who occupy positions of trust. 1. Managerial employees and 2. Those who, in the normal and routine exercise of their functions, regularly handle significant amounts of money or property. Breach of trust is willful if it is done intentionally, knowingly, and purposely, without justifiable excuse, as distinguished from an act done carelessly, thoughtlessly, heedlessly, or inadvertently. 
What are examples in jurisprudence of willful breach of trust? 1. When an employee displays arrogance, hostility, stubborn, and uncompromising stance towards the company. 2. Misappropriation of company funds. 3. Corrupt practices. And 4. Conflict of interest. Note the doctrine of loss of trust and confidence. The effect of breach of trust is loss of confidence. In the application of the doctrine of loss of trust and confidence, the treatment of rank-and-file employees differs from managerial employees and those holding positions of trust. Managerial employees and those holding positions of trust may be dismissed on the mere existence of a basis for believing that they breached the trust and confidence of the employer. However, in the case of rank-and-file employees, dismissal due to loss of confidence requires a higher proof of involvement in the questioned acts. What are the guidelines for applying the doctrine of loss of confidence? Number one, the loss of confidence should not be simulated. Number two, it should not be used as a subterfuge for causes which are improper, illegal, or unjustified. Number three, it may not be arbitrarily asserted in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. And number four, it must be genuine and not a mere afterthought to justify an earlier action taken in bad faith. Commission of a crime. To constitute a ground for dismissal, the crime must be committed against the person of the employer, that is the owner, immediate member of the employer's family, that is parents, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, grandparents, and grandchildren, or authorized representative of the employer, for instance, managers and supervisors. This contemplates crimes against persons such as murder, homicide, and the like. Other crimes that may be committed by the employee, such as those against property, chastity, honor, personal liberty, etc., will still constitute a valid cause for dismissal, but under the category of serious misconduct or as an analogous cause. Analogous causes. What are examples in jurisprudence of analogous causes? Number one, unreasonable behavior and unpleasant deportment in dealing with the people she closely works. This is analogous to serious misconduct. Number two, theft committed by an employee against a co-employee. This is analogous to serious misconduct. Number three, obesity of a flight attendant. When placed in the context of his work, it becomes an analogous cause for terminating an employment under Article 297E of the Labor Code. A person's obesity may not be unintended but it is nonetheless voluntary. Number four, attitude problem. This is analogous to willful breach of trust. An employee who cannot get along with his co-employees is detrimental to the company because he can upset and strain the working environment. Without the necessary teamwork and synergy, the organization cannot function well. When personal differences between employees and management affect the work environment, the peace of the company is affected. Thus. An employee's attitude problem is a valid ground for his termination. It is a situation analogous to loss of trust and confidence that must be duly proved by the employer. Number five, gross inefficiency. This is analogous to gross neglect of duty. And number six, gross negligence. Analogous to gross neglect of duty. Note the other valid causes for dismissal. Number one, immorality. Immorality refers to a conduct which does not conform to what society views as moral. From the legal standpoint, as to what is moral or immoral should be viewed not from the religious perspective, but from the public and secular viewpoint. This is because jurisdiction of courts is confined only to public and secular morality. Accordingly, when the law speaks of immoral or disgraceful conduct, it pertains to public and secular morality and not to religious morality. Public and secular morality refers to those conduct which are prescribed because they are detrimental to human society. Pregnancy out of wedlock may be immoral from the religious perspective, but is not necessarily immoral from the public and secular viewpoint. Pregnancy out of wedlock is immoral if the woman got pregnant by a man who is married to another. The immoral conduct consists of having extramarital relations with a married person. 
pregnancy out of wedlock is not immoral if the woman who is not married got pregnant by an unmarried man. Number two, drug abuse. An employee found positive for use of dangerous drugs may be penalized with dismissal. Number three, violation of company rules and regulations. Whether dismissal is an appropriate penalty for violation of company rules and regulations will depend upon the surrounding facts and circumstances of each case. Factors such as gravity of the offense, position occupied by the employee, habitualness, etc. will have to be considered. Violation of safety rules. The Supreme Court upheld the validity of dismissal of an employee for smoking inside the painting booth, which contained inflammable dust and materials, in violation of the prohibition imposed by company rules. Violation by an airline pilot of the liquor ban. The Supreme Court upheld the validity of the dismissal of a pilot who drank intoxicating liquor in violation of the rule prohibiting pilots from drinking intoxicating liquor 12 hours before flight. Violation of the rule against sleeping while on duty. The Supreme Court upheld the validity of the dismissal of an employee who was caught twice sleeping in violation of the rule against sleeping while on duty. Number four, failure to comply with a government regulation. Employees who fail to meet standards required by law may be validly dismissed. Number five, breach of union security agreement. If there is a union security agreement, covered employees must join the union and or maintain their union membership in good standing as a condition for continued employment. If an employee refuses to become a union member or if he fails to maintain his membership in good standing, the contracting union can demand from the employer the dismissal of such employee and the employer is bound to dismiss the employee in accordance with what has been stipulated. Number six, staging an illegal strike. Union officers who knowingly participate in an illegal strike may be dismissed or be declared to have lost their employment status. Number seven, commission of illegal acts during a strike. Union officers or workers who knowingly participate in the commission of illegal acts during a strike may be dismissed or be declared to have lost their employment status. Number eight, defiance of return to work order. When the Secretary of Labor and Employment assumes jurisdiction over a labor dispute, a strike is automatically enjoined. Strikers, whether union officers or plain members, who do not return to work may be dismissed or declared to have lost their employment status. Number nine, sexual harassment. Sexual harassment is the act of demanding or requesting sexual favor by a person having authority or moral ascendancy over another, regardless of whether the demand or request is accepted or not. Under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act, sexual harassment may be committed only when there is a superior subordinate relationship. Sexual harassment is not about a man taking advantage of a woman because of sexual desire. It is about power being exercised by a superior officer over his subordinates. The power emanates from the fact that the superior can remove the subordinate from his workplace if the latter would refuse his amorous advances. The gravamen of the offense of sexual harassment is not the violation of sexuality, but the abuse of power by the superior. If there is no superior subordinate relationship, the employee will still be liable for violation of the Safe Spaces Act, which prohibits gender-based sexual harassment in the workplace. Under the Anti-Sexual Harassment Act, sexual harassment may be committed, number one, in a work-related or employment environment, or number two, in an education or training environment. Who can be victims of sexual harassment? Number one, in a work-related or employment environment, the victim can be an employee or an applicant for employment. In an education or training environment, the victim can be a person who is under the care custody, or supervision of the offender, or whose education or training is entrusted to the offender. How is sexual harassment committed in a work-related environment? Number one, when sexual favor is made as a condition for hiring, reemployment, continued employment, or granting favorable terms, conditions, or privileges. Number two, when sexual advances impair the employee's rights or privileges, or result in an intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment for the employee. Number three, when refusal to grant the sexual favor results in discrimination, 
deprivation or diminution of employment opportunities, or otherwise adversely affect said employee. How is sexual harassment committed in an education or training environment? Number one, when sexual favor is made as a condition for giving of a passing grade, granting of honors and scholarships, payment of benefits, privileges, or considerations. Number two, when sexual advances result in intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment for the trainee or apprentice. Remember that the request for sexual favor need not be articulated in a categorical manner. It may be discerned with equal certitude from the acts of the superior. It is not even essential that the demand, request, or requirement be made as a condition for continued employment or for promotion. It is enough that the acts resulted in creating an intimidating, hostile, or offensive environment for the employee. Gender-based sexual harassment in the workplace is prohibited. Under the Safe Spaces Act, gender-based sexual harassment in the workplace includes number 1. Unwelcome sexual advances or request for sexual favors. Number 2. Unwelcome, unreasonable, and offensive conduct of sexual nature. Number 3. Unwelcome and pervasive conduct that creates an intimidating, hostile, or humiliating environment for the recipient. These acts may be done verbally, physically, or through technology, such as text messaging, electronic mail, or any other forms of information and communication systems. Remember that employers are obliged to create a committee on decorum to investigate and address complaints of gender-based sexual harassment. The committee shall be composed of representatives from management, supervisory employees, rank-and-file employees, and the union, if any. At least one half of its members should be women. And the committee should be headed by a woman. Remember the procedure for terminating the services of an employee for a just cause. Due process must be observed because what is at stake is the employee's means of livelihood. The right of a person to employment is deemed property within the meaning of constitutional guarantees. Hence, an employee cannot be deprived of this employment without due process of law. Standards of due process. Number one, issuance of notice to explain. Number two, conduct of administrative hearing if necessary. And number three, issuance of a notice of decision. Notice to explain. The notice to explain should be in writing. A verbal instruction to explain is not considered as substantial compliance. In a case, a conference or consultation meeting was not considered as substantial compliance with the notice requirement. In another case, an audit was not considered as substantial compliance with the notice requirement. The notice to explain must be specific. It should specify in detail the acts or omissions committed to enable the employee to intelligently prepare his explanation and defenses. A notice to explain couched in two general terms without any narration whatsoever as to how the infraction was committed does not satisfy the due process requirement. The notice must give the employee reasonable period to explain. In the case of King of Kings, Transport versus Mamak, the Supreme Court held that a minimum of five days from notice is the reasonable period, enough to give the employee an opportunity to study the accusation against him, consult a union official or lawyer, gather data and evidence, and decide on the defenses they will raise against the charge. Preventive Suspension if the continued presence of the employee poses a serious and imminent threat to the life and property of the employer or of his co-employees, the employer may place the employee under preventive suspension. Preventive suspension is improper if the continued presence of the employee does not pose a serious and imminent threat to the life and property of the employer or of his co-employees. For example, if the employee was preventively suspended because he failed to attend a meeting called by his supervisor, the preventive suspension is unjustified because failure to attend the meeting does not prejudice the employer. Neither does the employee's presence in the company premises pose a serious threat to his employer and co-workers. Preventive suspension is not a penalty but a mere preliminary step in an administrative investigation. It is a preventive measure for the protection of the life or property of the employer or co-employees pending investigation of the charges against the employee. Administrative hearing. 
If necessary, the employer may conduct an administrative hearing to give the employee the fullest opportunity to be heard or to clarify unclear declarations. Hearing is not a matter of right in a disciplinary proceeding because disciplinary proceedings are summary in nature. If the employee wants a hearing to be conducted, he should ask for it. If ever a hearing is to be conducted, it is not the formal trial-type proceeding as what is being done in regular courts. The employee need not be apprised of the right to counsel. The obligation to apprise a person of his right to counsel applies to custodial investigations and not to administrative investigations by an employer against an erring employee. Confrontation of witnesses is not essential. Confrontation of witnesses is required only in adversarial criminal prosecutions and not in company investigations for the administrative liability of the employee. Notice of Decision After evaluating the evidence on record, the employer must give the employee a written notice of decision indicating the penalty for the offense if found guilty or exonerating the employee if the evidence does not prove any culpability. In either case, the justification for the decision must be stated. If the employee feels aggrieved by the decision, he can contest the validity thereof by filing the appropriate complaint with the Arbitration Branch of the National Labor Relations Commission under Article 292 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. What is the effect if an employer dismisses an employee without observing due process? Where the dismissal is valid, lack of statutory due process does not nullify the dismissal or render it illegal, much less ineffectual. However, the employee is liable for nominal damages. Remember this as the belated due process rule. What is the degree of proof required to establish the validity of dismissal? Substantial evidence is enough. The right to dismiss is not dependent upon a verdict of guilt or innocence in a criminal case. An employer can dismiss an erring employee, number one, even if the employee was not criminally prosecuted, number two, even if the criminal case was dropped, number three, even if the prosecutor dismissed the criminal complaint, or number four, even if the court orders the acquittal of the employee. Acquittal of an employee in the criminal case does not invalidate the dismissal of said employee. Subsequent conviction of an employee in the criminal case for the offense that resulted in his dismissal will nullify the final judgment declaring the dismissal illegal. Authorized causes for terminating employment. Refer to Article 298 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. Number 1. Installation of labor-saving devices. Number 2. Redundancy. Number 3. Retrenchment to prevent losses. And number 4. Closing or cessation of the operation of the establishment. Here, the employee is not at fault, but the law nevertheless authorizes the termination of employment in recognition of certain business realities, particularly the prerogative of every business concern to institute appropriate measures to ensure increased productivity, economic viability, and competitiveness. Installation of labor-saving devices. Employers have the right to follow economic policies to ensure profit and for this purpose to mechanize even if in the process it results in the dismissal of employees. Redundancy Redundancy is a mode of reducing personnel when the required services are more than what is demanded by the actual requirements of the enterprise. Redundancy may arise from overhiring of workers, decreased volume of business, dropping of a product line or service activity, or abolition of position or reorganization. Note the requisites of a valid redundancy program. Number one, the abolition of redundant positions must be done in good faith. And number two, fair and reasonable criteria must be used in ascertaining what positions are to be declared redundant. The abolition of redundant positions must be done in good faith. The employer's good faith in implementing a redundancy program is not necessarily destroyed by the engagement of an independent contractor to replace the services of the employees terminated from service. Redundancy can exist even if there is no other person holding the same position as that held by the employee declared to be redundant. The last-in, first-out principle is not applicable to redundancy. This is because, in redundancy, what is looked into is the position itself, the nature of the services performed, and the necessity of such position. Losses is not a condition for redundancy. This is because in redundancy, 
What is looked into is not the financial condition of the company, but the position itself, the nature of the services performed by the employee, and the necessity of such position. Retrenchment. Retrenchment is a mode of reducing personnel to prevent or minimize business losses and thus protect and preserve the employer's viability. Retrenchment is usually adopted when there is actual or anticipated losses, lack of work, seasonal fluctuations, reduction in the volume of business, shortage of materials, recession, lack of orders, or industrial depression. Note the distinctions between retrenchment and redundancy. In redundancy, services of the employees are terminated because they are superfluous or unnecessary. In retrenchment, services of the employees are terminated to prevent or minimize business losses even if they are not superfluous or unnecessary. Redundancy is usually the result of reorganization, overhiring of workers, decreased volume of business, dropping of a product line, or phasing out of a service activity. Retrenchment is usually the result of a business recession, industrial depression, seasonal fluctuations, lack of work, or considerable reduction in the volume of the employer's business. In redundancy, the last-in, first-out principle does not apply. In retrenchment, the last-in, first-out principle is usually applied. Separation pay for redundancy is at least one month pay or one month pay for every year of service, whichever is higher. Separation pay for retrenchment is one month pay or at least one half month pay for every year of service, whichever is higher. Remember the requisites of a valid retrenchment program. Number one, the retrenchment is necessary to prevent losses. Number two, fair and reasonable criteria must be used in ascertaining who would be dismissed and who would be retained. Number three, the retrenchment must be resorted to as a measure of last resort and after less drastic means have been tried and found wanting or insufficient. Losses as a ground for retrenchment. The losses may be actual or expected. Article 298 of the Labor Code of the Philippines uses the phrase retrenchment to prevent losses. This means that an employer can adopt retrenchment measures even before the anticipated losses are sustained. Expected losses must be imminent and substantial as perceived by the employer. Actual losses should also be substantial. Losses may be proven by the income statement or audited financial statements. However, audited financial statement is not required if the retrenchment was undertaken to prevent future losses or if the employer is under rehabilitation or receivership. A comparative statement of revenue and expenses is not sufficient proof of losses. Fair and reasonable criteria in asserting those who would be dismissed. Fair and reasonable criteria include number one, efficiency, number two, seniority, or last in, first out, number three, physical fitness, number four, age, number five, financial hardship for certain workers, or number six, status of employment, that is temporary, casual regular or managerial employees. The employer should first try less drastic means. Before embarking on retrenchment, the employer should first try other means short of termination of employment, such as, number one, rotation of workers, number two, reduced time, number three, improving manufacturing inefficiencies, number four, trimming manufacturing costs, number five, reducing advertising costs, or number six, reducing of bonuses and salaries of management and rank-and-file employees. Closure of establishment. Note the closure contemplated by Article 298 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. Number one, permanent closure, which could be total or partial. Number two, initiated by the employer and not by the government. If the closure was forced upon by the government without any fault on the part of the employer, the employer is not under obligation to give separation pay. Note the distinction between closure of establishment and retrenchment. In closure, due to business losses, there is a complete cessation of a whole or part of the business operations. Whereas in retrenchment to prevent losses, the business continues to operate but with reduced manpower. Note the situations considered as closure of establishment. Number one, sale of an airplane specifically assigned to a pilot 
is analogous to closure or cessation of a business enterprise. It's because the employment of the pilot depends on the continued operation of the plane. If there's no more plane, no pilot would be needed and the job would be ipso facto non-existent. Or number two, relocation of plant. Note the procedure for terminating an employment for an authorized cause. Advance notice. The employer should serve a written notice at least one month in advance to the affected employees and the Department of Labor and Employment. The notice to the affected employees must be served personally to the employees concerned. This is mandatory. The mere posting of a notice in the employee's bulletin board is not substantial compliance with the statutory requirement. The notice to the Department of Labor and Employment must be filed with the regional offices and not with the field offices. The required notice is different from the Establishment Termination Report, which the Department of Labor and Employment requires to be filled out. Note the purposes of the one-month notice. Number one, this is to enable the employee to survive while he is looking for another job. And number two, to give the Department of Labor and Employment an opportunity to ascertain the veracity of the cause for termination. What is the effect of a failure to comply with the notice requirement? The employer will be held liable for nominal damages if the termination is valid. Note the relief for employees whose services were terminated for authorized causes. It's separation pay. What's the rate of separation pay? At least one month pay or one month pay for every year of service, whichever is higher for installation of labor-saving devices or redundancy. At least one month pay or one half month pay for every year of service, whichever is higher, for retrenchment to prevent losses or closure of establishment not due to serious business losses. There's no separation pay if the closure is due to an act of the government without fault on the part of the employer or due to serious business losses. The phrase for every year of service means actual service. It excludes the time when the establishment was closed, or seasonal workers did not render any service because it was off-season. It includes the time when the employee did not render service because of authorized leaves of absences, regular holidays, or mandatory fulfillment of a military or civic duty. In computing the length of service, a fraction of at least six months is considered as one whole year. For instance, if the employee has rendered five years and six months, his length of service is six years. Reckoning of length of service of an employee who was validly dismissed but later rehired. It shall be reckoned from the date of rehiring and not from the date of initial hiring. Reckoning of length of service of an employee who was ordered absorbed into the regular workforce because of labor-only contracting. The length of service shall be reckoned not from the date of absorption, but from the first day of service. Separation pay is computed based on the latest salary unless the same was reduced by the employer to defeat the intention of the Labor Code of the Philippines, in which case the separation pay shall be based on the salary rate before its deduction. Note the separation pay of peace rate workers. It shall be computed based on applicable minimum wage if there is no specially prescribed wage rates for peace rate workers. Note the separation pay of salesmen on commission basis. It shall be computed based on their average commissions earned during the past year of employment. Note the separation pay of seasonal employees. It shall be computed at one half of their respective average monthly pay during the last season multiplied by the number of years they actually rendered service, provided that they worked for at least six months during a given year. Can an employee whose services were terminated for authorized causes be entitled to both separation pay and retirement pay? Number one, if there's no retirement plan or CBA providing for retirement benefit, the employee is not entitled to both separation pay and retirement pay. This is because separation pay and retirement pay are reliefs for two distinct types of terminating unemployment. Separation pay is a relief given to employees whose services are terminated for any of the authorized causes specifically installation of labor-saving devices, 
redundancy, retrenchment to prevent losses, or closure of establishment not due to serious losses and disease. Retirement pay, on the other hand, is a relief given to employees who retire or are retired after reaching a certain age or number of years of service. Therefore, as to what relief the employee would be entitled should be determined by the mode by which the employment was terminated. Thus, if the employment was terminated because of installation of labor-saving devices, redundancy, retrenchment to prevent losses, closure of establishment not due to serious losses, and disease, the relief should be separation pay only. If the employment was terminated because of retirement, the relief should be retirement pay only. It cannot be both. Otherwise, there would be double compensation, which is frowned upon by law. There can only be one mode of termination of employment with respect to one and the same employee. Either the employee retired or was terminated for an authorized cause. It cannot be both. Number two, if there is a retirement plan or CBA providing for retirement benefit, the employee may be entitled to both separation pay and retirement pay if the retirement plan or CBA does not expressly prohibit recovery of both benefits. Termination by reason of disease. Note the conditions for terminating an employment due to illness. Number one, the continued employment of the sick employee is prohibited by law or is prejudicial to his health or to the health of his co-employees. And number two, there must be a certification from a competent public health authority that the disease is of such nature or at such a stage that it cannot be cured within a period of six months, even with proper medical treatment. A medical certificate is indispensable. Without the medical certificate from the competent public health authority attesting that the disease is of such a nature or at such stage that it cannot be cured within six months, even with proper medical treatment, the termination of employment is illegal. The burden is upon the employer to obtain the certificate from a competent public authority. If the disease is curable within six months, then the employee should be allowed to take a leave. Upon restoration of his normal health, he should be reinstated to his former position immediately. If the disease is not curable within six months, the services of the employee may be terminated, in which case, he is entitled to separation pay equivalent to at least one month salary or to one half month salary for every year of service, whichever is greater. The illness contemplated by Article 299 of the Labor Code of the Philippines is not confined to contagious diseases. Non-communicable diseases are also covered, such as stroke, heart attack, osteoarthritis, eye cataract, and mental illness. Note the diseases that cannot be a ground for termination of employment. Number one, HIV infection. Actual, perceived, or suspected HIV infection is not a ground for dismissal from employment. Number two, hepatitis B infection. Actual, perceived, or suspected hepatitis B infection is not a ground for dismissal from employment. Number three, pregnancy-related illness. Pregnancy-related illness is not a ground for dismissal from employment because that would violate the Labor Code provision prohibiting the dismissal of a female employee on account of pregnancy. Resignation Note the types of resignation. Number one, voluntary resignation. Number two, involuntary resignation. And number three, constructive resignation. Voluntary resignation under Article 300. Voluntary resignation is a formal renouncement or relinquishment of a job by an employee who finds himself in a situation where he believes that personal reasons cannot be sacrificed in favor of the exigency of service, that he has no other choice but to dissociate himself from his employment. Note the elements of voluntary resignation. Number one, it should be unconditional. Number two, there should be intent to relinquish the job. And number three, it should be accompanied by an act of relinquishment. There is no intent to relinquish when the employee, after recuperating from his illness, goes back to the company to signify his desire to resume his work and files a complaint for illegal dismissal after he was refused admission. Intent to relinquish the job can be inferred, number one, from the actuations of the employee. For example, when the employee informs his employer of his desire to resign and discusses the terms of his separation, but during the pendency of the discussions, 
he renders services to a rival firm. Number two, from the wordings of a letter. For example, if the employee sends a letter expressing his frustrations in his job and his differences with his immediate superior, couched in terms that are incendiary and sarcastic. This could be construed as intent to relinquish even if the letter does not mention the words resign or resignation. This is because the letter is inconsistent with the desire for continued employment. Note the indications of voluntariness. Number one, expressions of gratitude in the resignation letter is an indication of voluntariness. Expression of gratitude cannot possibly come from an employee who was forced to resign as they belie allegations of coercion. Number two, if the employee who was given the option to resign or be dismissed for cause chooses to resign, then the resignation is voluntary. There is nothing illegal with the practice of allowing an employee to resign instead of being dismissed for cause so as not to smear his employment record. A decision to give a graceful exit to an employee rather than to file an action for redress is perfectly within the discretion of an employer. It is not uncommon that an employee is permitted to resign to save face after the exposure of a malfeasance. Number three, if the employee who misappropriated company funds resigns because of the employer's threat to file criminal action for a staff against him, the resignation is voluntary. The threat to file criminal action is not an unjust act, but rather a valid and legal act to enforce a claim. Hence, it cannot at all be considered as intimidation. If the claim is just or legal, the threat to enforce one's claim through competent authority does not vitiate consent. Number four, if the employee is affected by the organization, chose to resign after being given the option to resign with higher separation benefits or be dismissed with normal separation benefits only, the resignation is voluntary. Number five, if an employee resigns because he was having trouble with his job, coupled with the fact that he could not get along with his staff and immediate superior, the resignation is voluntary. Number six, voluntariness of resignation is not negated by the fact that it was the employer who prepared the letter of resignation for the employee to sign. Even if the employee was made to sign a ready-made resignation letter, it does not necessarily mean that the employee was coerced or intimidated to sign it particularly so when the employee is not an ordinary employee with limited education. Courtesy resignations. Requiring employees to submit courtesy resignations is tantamount to forced resignation, hence illegal, because it violates the right to security of tenure. Under Article 300A of the Labor Code of the Philippines, voluntary resignation requires one-month notice. What is the purpose of the one-month notice? This is to enable the employer to look for a replacement to prevent a disruption of work. If the one-month period lapses, the employee can leave his employment even if the employer has not yet found a replacement and even if the operation of the company would be affected. What is the effect of failure to give one-month notice? The only recourse is to hold the employee liable for damages. The employer cannot compel the employee to work during the one-month period because that would amount to involuntary servitude. The one-month notice may be waived by the employer. The rule requiring an employee to stay or complete the 30-day period prior to the effectivity of his resignation is discretionary on the part of the employer. Hence, the employer may waive the entire 30-day period or allow the employee a shorter period before his resignation becomes effective. When does voluntary resignation become effective? Upon acceptance or approval by the employer. What's the effect of acceptance or resignation? Once accepted, resignation may not be withdrawn without the consent of the employer. Resignation is not deemed accepted if the employee was still required to report for work and explain his unauthorized absences. Withdrawal of resignation. Resignation, even if termed irrevocable, may still be withdrawn before it's accepted or approved. The resignation does not become effective if withdrawn prior to its acceptance or approval. An employee who voluntarily resigns from his employment is not entitled to separation pay unless sanctioned by established company policy, employment contract, or collective bargaining agreement. Constructive resignation or abandonment of employment. 
note the concept of abandonment of employment. It is the deliberate, unjustified refusal of an employee to resume his work. To constitute abandonment of job, there must be number one, prolonged absence without leave, and number two, the intent to abandon or sever the employment relationship. There is no intent to abandon if the employee immediately files an action for reinstatement. This rule, however, does not apply to cases where the complaint for illegal dismissal prays for separation pay only without reinstatement. How does one establish intent to abandon? Number one, a notice to report for work should be sent to the last known address of the employee. Number two, if the employee does not report, it would be prudent to send a second notice to report for work. Number three, if the employee does not report for work despite receipt of the notices, it would already indicate intent to abandon. What is the course of action if the employee reports for work as directed? He should be charged with absence without leave, and the corresponding penalty, including dismissal, should be meted out against him. Note the distinction between abandonment and AWOL. In abandonment of employment, there is no intention to return to work, whereas in AWOL, there is intention to return to work. Who has the burden of proving abandonment? The burden of proof is on the employer to show clear and deliberate intent on the part of the employee to discontinue employment without intention of returning. If abandonment of employment is not proven, it will not exonerate the employee from being sanctioned for absence without leave or AWOL. Involuntary resignation or constructive dismissal under Article 300B. What is the meaning of constructive dismissal? Constructive dismissal is involuntary resignation brought about by the harsh, hostile, and unfavorable conditions set by the employer. It is an act amounting to dismissal but made to appear as if it were not because the employer does things that are intended to force the employee to give up his employment. The test of constructive dismissal is whether a reasonable person in the employee's position would have felt to give up his position because the employer or his representative subjected the employee to serious insult or inhuman and unbearable treatment, or that the employer or his representative has committed a crime against the person of the employee or immediate family members. Unbearable treatment must be more than occasional discomforts brought about by misunderstandings. The unreasonably harsh conditions that compel an employee to quit must be way beyond the occasional discomforts brought about by the misunderstandings between the employer and the employee. As in every human relationship, there are bound to be disagreements. However, when strong words from the employer happen without palpable reason or are expressed only for the purpose of degrading the dignity of the employee, then a hostile work environment is created, for which the employee would be justified in quitting. Note the examples of constructive dismissal. Number one, demotion without just cause. There is constructive dismissal when an employee quits his job because he was demoted without just cause. Number two, unwarranted discrimination. There is constructive dismissal if the employee quits his job because his immediate superior discriminated against him without reason. Number three, quitting employment out of fear for his life. An employee who quits his employment out of fear for his life is deemed to have been constructively dismissed. The resignation of the employee is not voluntary because it is impelled by a legitimate desire for self-preservation. Number four, prolonged preventive suspension. An employer who places an employee under preventive suspension for a period exceeding the allowable time may be held liable for a constructive dismissal. Note the instances that are not considered as constructive dismissal. Number one, there is no constructive dismissal when an employee who was placed under preventive suspension during the pendency of investigation, resigns after the internet access of the employee was disconnected. Such disconnection is a protective measure intended to prevent the employee from having further access to the company's network-based documents and forms while the investigation is ongoing. Number two, there is no constructive dismissal if an employee quits his employment after being demoted for a just cause. One month notice is not required for involuntary resignations. If the employee decides to quit his job because continued employment has become unbearable for him, 
A one-month advance notice is not required. The employee can leave his employment immediately for obvious reasons. What's the relief for constructive dismissal? Separation pay and back wages computed from the time the employee stopped working up to the finality of decision would be the appropriate relief. What's the back wages of a probationary employee who was constructively dismissed? If the employee was constructively dismissed is a probationary employee, his back wages shall be reckoned from the time of constructive dismissal until the expiration of the probationary employment contract. This is because the lapse of the probationary employment period effectively severed the employer-employee relationship between the parties. Note the difference between voluntary resignation and constructive dismissal. Number one, in resignation, the employee voluntarily relinquishes his employment for personal reasons. In constructive dismissal, the employee involuntarily quits his employment because of harsh, hostile, and unbearable working conditions set by the employer. Number two, in resignation, it requires the employee to give one month notice. In constructive dismissal, this does not require prior notice. Number three, in resignation, this does not entitle the employee to separation pay. In constructive dismissal, the same entitles the employee to separation pay plus back wages. Temporary layoff. Article 301 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. What is the meaning of layoff? Layoff is the temporary separation of employees from service because of temporary closure or suspension of operations. What are the causes of temporary closure or suspension of operations? Lack of orders, lack of work, lack of materials, reduction in the volume of business, losses in business operations, business recession, industrial depression, seasonal fluctuations, conversion of plant for a new production program, or a government order. What is an example of a layoff? Temporary off detail or floating status of a security guard is a form of layoff. In security parlance, it means waiting to be posted. Note the distinction between layoff and dismissal. Dismissal is permanent separation from service, while layoff is only a temporary separation. Note the legal effect of temporary closure. Number one, if done in good faith, the employment status is merely suspended. Hence, the employer must reinstate the affected employees if they indicate their desire to resume their work not later than one month from resumption of operations. Number two, if done in bad faith, the employment relationship will be deemed uninterrupted. Hence, the affected employees will be entitled to their wages for the duration of the suspension of operations. Note the duration of temporary closure. This is up to six months, whether done in good faith or bad faith. Take note, a complaint for illegal dismissal filed prior to the lapse of the six-month period is generally considered as prematurely filed. After six months, closure will become permanent. Hence, employer-employee relationship will automatically terminate. Notwithstanding the bad faith, the employer cannot be compelled to continue its business. Can the six-month temporary closure be extended? Under Department Order 215, Series of 2020, in case of declaration of war, pandemic, and similar national emergencies, the employer and the employees, through the union, if any, or with the assistance of the Department of Labor and Employment, may agree in good faith to extend the temporary closure for another period not exceeding six months. The extension should be reported by the employer to the regional office of the Department of Labor and Employment 10 days prior to the effectivity. If the employees find alternative employment during the extended temporary closure, their employment status remains suspended except when they voluntarily and unequivocally resign in writing. If the employer decides to reduce its personnel before, during, or after the extended temporary closure, the affected employees shall be entitled to separation pay as prescribed by the Labor Code of the Philippines, company policies, or collective bargaining agreement, whichever is higher. In the computation of length of service for purposes of computing separation pay, the first six months of temporary closure shall be included. If an employer resumes operations, the retrenched employees shall have priority in the rehiring if they indicate their desire to resume work not later than one month from the resumption of operations. Note the entitlements of the employees affected by the permanent closure. 
Number one, if closure is done in good faith, separation pay of at least one month pay or one half month pay for every year of service, whichever is higher. Unless the closure was due to serious business losses, in which case the employees are not entitled to separation pay. Number two, if closure is done in bad faith, it's wages during the six-month period of closure and separation pay of at least one month pay or one half month pay for every year of service, whichever is higher. Fulfillment of a military or civic duty. If an employee is called upon for military or civic duty, his employment will be suspended for the duration of such civic or military duty, even if such duty exceeds six months. This is because when the state orders a citizen to render military or civic duty, there is no choice except to comply. However, in order to keep his employment, the employee must signify his desire to resume his work not later than one month from his discharge from the military or civic duty. Retirement from service. What's the concept of retirement? It is the withdrawal from office, employment, or occupation upon reaching a certain age or after rendering a certain number of years of service. Note the distinction between retirement, resignation, and dismissal. In retirement, the employer and employee agree to terminate the employment relation upon reaching a certain age or after rendering a certain number of years of service. In resignation, the employee terminates the employment relation for personal reasons. In dismissal, the employer terminates the employment relation for just cause. Who are entitled to the Labor Code Retirement Benefit? Generally, all employees are entitled to retirement benefits under the Labor Code of the Philippines, regardless of their position, designation, or status, and irrespective of the method by which their wages are paid. Domestic helpers and persons in the personal service of another are entitled to the retirement benefits prescribed by the Labor Code of the Philippines. Who are not entitled to the Labor Code Retirement Benefit? Number one, employees who have not rendered service for at least five years. And number two, employees of retail, service, or agricultural establishments regularly employing not more than 10 employees. A retail establishment is a business entity principally engaged in the sale of goods to end users for personal or household use. A retail establishment loses its retail character if it engages in both retail and wholesale of goods. Therefore, if a business establishment with a regular workforce of not more than 10 employees engages in both retail and wholesale of goods, it is not exempted from giving retirement benefits. A service establishment is a business entity principally engaged in the sale of service to individuals for their own household use and is generally recognized as such. An agricultural establishment refers to an employer engaged in farming activities, specifically cultivation and tillage of the soil, production and cultivation, production, cultivation, growing, and harvesting of any agricultural or horticultural commodities, dairying, or any activity performed on a farm as an incident to or in conjunction with such farming operations. Farming activities do not include the manufacture and or processing of farm products such as sugar, coconut, abaca, tobacco, pineapple, or aquatic products. When can an employee retire or be retired? Number one, if there is a retirement plan, CBA, or employment contract, an employee can retire or be retired upon reaching the criteria established in the retirement plan, CBA, or employment contract. Number two, if there's no retirement plan, CBA, or employment contract, an employee can retire upon reaching the age of 60 years or 65 years as prescribed by Article 302 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. Is early retirement valid? It is valid if there's an agreement between the employer and the employees. The employer and the employees may agree to set the criteria for early retirement in an employment contract or in a CBA. The criteria could be age, as could be gleaned from the opening sentence of Article 302 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. The criteria could also be number of years of service. Thus, a CBA, which provides for retirement of employees after rendering a certain number of years of service, is valid and enforceable. The criteria could also be the number of flying hours in case of pilots. Thus, a retirement plan agreed upon between the company and the union, which allows the airline company to retire pilots upon 
attaining 20,000 flying hours is valid. Remember that consent is required for early retirement under a retirement plan. If early retirement is to be based on a retirement plan, the employee should express his consent or conformity with the terms of the retirement plan. Without the employee's consent, the retirement plan cannot be used as basis to retire an employee. The mere mention of the retirement plan in the letter of appointment cannot be construed as a consent, especially when the letter of appointment does not specify the details of the retirement program. Acceptance of an option to retire early must be explicit, voluntary, free, and uncompelled. What is the optional retirement age under the Labor Code of the Philippines? Number one, 60 years old for ordinary employees. Number two, 50 years old for underground and surface mine workers. Surface mine workers refer to mill plant workers, electrical, mechanical, and tailing spawn personnel. Who can exercise the option to retire under the Labor Code of the Philippines? It's only the employee under Article 302 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. What is the compulsory retirement age under the Labor Code? Number one, 55 years old for professional race jockeys. Number two, 60 years old for underground and surface mine workers. Number three, 65 years old for ordinary employees under Article 302 and 302A of the Labor Code of the Philippines. How much is the amount of retirement pay? Number one, if there is a retirement plan, CBA, or employment contract, the amount of retirement pay will primarily be determined by the provisions of the retirement plan, CBA, or employment contract, if any. But it should not fall below the floor limits set by the Labor Code of the Philippines. If the amount is less than what the Labor Code provides, then the employer shall pay the difference. If the retirement fund is contributory, the employer's total contribution should not be less than the retirement pay prescribed by the Labor Code. If the employer's contribution is less than the amount prescribed by the labor code, then the employer shall pay the difference. If there is no retirement plan, CBA, or employment contract, the retirement pay shall be that prescribed by the Labor Code of the Philippines. The retirement pay under the Labor Code of the Philippines is generally a total of 22.5 days for every year of service because by law, it is composed of the following. 15 days salary based on the latest rate, cash equivalent of 5 days service incentive leave, and one twelfth of the 13-month pay due the employee. Whether the retirement was optional or compulsory, the employee is entitled to one half month salary for every year of service, the one half month being completed at 22.5 days. The law does not make a distinction as to the retirement benefits granted in either case. Computation of one half month salary of employees who do not have fixed wages. Number one, for employees paid purely on commission, their one half month salary shall be based on their respective average commissions earned during the past year of employment. Note, service incentive leave, 13 month pay, should not be added to the one half month salary because employees paid purely on commission basis are not entitled to service incentive leave and 13 month pay. Number two, for workers who are paid by results, their one-half month salary shall be based on their average daily salary for the last 12 months reckoned from the date of their retirement divided by the number of actual working days in that period. Take note, service incentive leave should not be added to the one-half month salary because workers paid by results are not entitled to service incentive leave. Number three, for seasonal workers, their one-half month salary shall be based on their respective average monthly pay during the last season multiplied by the number of years of actual service if they worked for at least six months during a given year. Considering that retirement pay is gauged by the term for every year of service, stress should be on actual service. The period when the establishment was closed should not be included. For seasonal workers, off-season period should not be included. The period covered by authorized leaves of absences Regular holidays and mandatory fulfillment of a military or civic duty should not be deducted from the length of service. How do we compute the length of service in case of rehiring of an employee who was validly dismissed? If the employment was validly severed and the employee was rehired, the length of service should be reckoned from the date of rehiring and not from the date of initial hiring. Computation of length of service if the employer was ordered to absorb the employee 
If the employee was ordered absorbed into the regular workforce because of labor-only contracting, the length of service should be reckoned not from the date of absorption but from the first day of service. Also remember that the SSS retirement benefit is separate. The retirement pay under the Labor Code is separate and distinct from the retirement pay under the Social Security Act. Extension of services after retirement. Upon retirement of an employee, whether optional or compulsory, his services may be continued or extended on a case-to-case -case basis upon agreement of the employer and the employee. Violation of the retirement provision of the Labor Code of the Philippines is a criminal offense which will subject the erring employer to the penalties prescribed under Article 303 of the Labor Code. Let's go to criminal offenses. Criminal offenses under the Labor Code of the Philippines refer to those violations which the Labor Code declares to be unlawful or penal in nature. Illegal dismissal is not a criminal offense, except those which the Labor Code of the Philippines expressly declares to be unlawful or penal in nature. Criminal jurisdiction of offenses punished under the Labor Code. There is a concurrent jurisdiction of the Municipal or Metropolitan Trial Court and the Regional Trial Court. Prescription of offenses and claims. Prescription of criminal offenses under Article 305. Offenses penalized under this code and the rules and regulations issued pursuant thereto shall prescribe in three years. Prescriptive period of a criminal action for illegal recruitment. Number one, illegal recruitment of workers for local employment. It's three years under the provisions of Article 305 of the Labor Code of the Philippines. Number two, illegal recruitment of overseas Filipino workers. For simple illegal recruitment, it's five years. For qualified illegal recruitment, that is syndicated or large scale, it's 20 years. Prescription of unfair labor practice. Number one, for the administrative aspect. It's one year from Commission of Unfair Labor Practice under Article 305. Number two, for the criminal aspect, it's one year from the finality of the judgment in the administrative case under Article 258. Prescriptive period for illegal dismissal. Number one, if the complaint prays for reinstatement, it's four years from the date of dismissal because the action is predicated upon an injury to the rights of the plaintiff which under Article 1146 of the Civil Code of the Philippines must be brought within four years. The four-year prescriptive period should be reckoned from the date the employee was illegally dismissed. The filing of a criminal case against the employee will not interrupt the running of the prescriptive period for filing the action for instatement because the right to file an action for illegal dismissal is not dependent upon the outcome of the criminal case. Number two, if the complaint Praise for separation pay only without reinstatement. It's three years from the date of dismissal because it is a money claim. Prescription of money claims under Article 306. All money claims arising from employer employee relations accruing during the effectivity of this code shall be filed within three years from the time the cause of action accrued. Otherwise, they shall forever be barred. Note the scope of money claims. This covers all money claims arising from an employer-employee relationship, including those recoverable under a CBA employment contract or company policy. Note the appropriate entities having jurisdiction over money claims. Number one, money claims with a prayer for reinstatement. It should be filed with the regional arbitration branches of the National Labor Relations Commission regardless of the amount involved. Number two, if there is no demand for reinstatement, Money claims not exceeding 5,000 pesos should be filed with the Regional Director of the Department of Labor and Employment. For a money claim exceeding 5,000 pesos, it should be filed with the Regional Arbitration Branch of the National Labor Relations Commission. Number three, for money claims of overseas Filipino workers, it should be filed with the Regional Arbitration Branches of the National Labor Relations Commission. Note the reckoning date of the prescriptive period. Number one, from the day of the commission of the violation, if such commission is known, or, number two, from discovery of the violation and institution of judicial proceedings for its investigation and punishment, if the commission of the violation was not known at the time. Prescriptive period for action. Prescriptive period for an action for accounting of union funds. Any action involving the funds of a labor organization prescribes after three years from whichever comes earlier of Number one, 
the date of submission of the annual financial report to the Department of Labor and Employment, or number two, the date the same should have been submitted as required by law. Remember Article 250. Finally, note the prescriptive period for claims for employees' compensation. Claims for employees' compensation prescribed in three years from the time the employee lost his earning capacity.